Okay, hello everyone. So this week's lectures focus on strike slip fault systems. And there will be three lecture modules. Uh, this first one focuses on common tectonic settings of strike slip faults, including transform faults. The second will focus on strike slip fault styles and physiography or uh, their geomorphology. It will also cover briefly how we measure geologic slip rates. And then the third is really a, just a short summary of some enigmas that remain regarding strikes of tectonics, some puzzles that are unanswered and that are avenues of active research. So let's start by discussing the common tectonic settings of strikes of faults. Um, I like to break them down into three categories, including transform faults, both oceanic and continental varieties. Zones of strike slip partitioning where oblique plate boundary motion is accommodated by a combination of strike parallel and strike perpendicular structures. And a category of strike slip faults that I think Sean has briefly mentioned already, where strike slip faults develop as zones of tectonic escape or uh, extrusion. We'll go through some key examples of each of these in this uh, module. So starting with transform faults, these were first recognized in 1965 by uh, a now famous geologist, Tuzo Wilson. And he described transform faults as strikes of faults that clearly define plate boundaries with their strikes parallel to the relative motion between the plates on either side. Because they themselves are plate boundaries, they'll always connect divergent and convergent plate boundaries and zones of shear. And note that because there's not a lot of vertical motion associated with them, nor substantial associated advection of heat, transforms only rarely uh, show uh, magmatism, unlike or in contrast to divergent and convergent plate boundaries. So just to show some examples of how transforms connect other plate boundaries via shear, the figure on the left is showing a transform that links two ridges, hopefully review for many of you. The ridges are spreading in opposite directions on either side of the transform fault, uh, resulting in right lateral simple shear in that example. The example in the middle is illustrating how transforms can connect a ridge and a trench. And the example on the right shows a transform fault that's connecting two subduction trenches. So Tuzo Wilson, in that paper I mentioned before, broke down dextral transform faults into further categories that are distinguished by their time evolution, that is, whether they're lengthening or shortening or remaining stable over time. And he recognized, for example, that ridge-ridge transforms should be constant length over time, but that ridge-trench transforms could either lengthen or shorten with time depending on uh, the polarity of subduction. Recall that the teeth uh, drawn here are on the hanging wall of the subduction zone. Those uh, barbs point toward the hanging wall. So if the transform is in the hanging wall of a subduction zone, it will lengthen over time as the trench rolls back. Whereas if the transform is in the foot wall, it will gradually be consumed, subducted essentially, and therefore it will shorten. The situation is of course similar for transforms that connect trenches. If the transform is in the hanging wall of uh, both subduction zones, it will just continue to grow over time. Whereas if it's in the foot wall of both, it will shorten and eventually be consumed. And if it's in the foot wall of one and the hanging wall of another, then uh, whether the transform lengthens or shortens depends on the relative rates of motion of each subduction trench. So here's the global distribution of trans transform faults presently. You can see, of course, that the vast majority of them are underwater and are connecting active ridge segments, uh, but there are several, um, both underwater and on land, that connect up other plate, boundaries type, plate boundary types. 
Note that only the transform sections that are between the ridge section segments of opposite spreading direction are actually active, whereas the rest of the transform fault is inactive and referred to as a fracture zone. Just a close up of what I mean by that, the sections of the transform that are not accommodating shear because they're moving in the same uh, direction at approximately the same rate, those are not active faults and instead are, are just uh, fracture zones. The largest known transform and associated fracture zones zone is the Romanche fracture zone in the mid-Atlantic. It's a very stark topographic feature on the seafloor. It's about eight kilometers deep, 900 kilometers wide, uh, long, and 20 kilometers wide. The active section of the transform is about 600 kilometers out of that 900. Note, of course, that the transform exhibits regular earthquakes, and these are very classic uh, strike slip, simple shear events uh, based on their focal mechanisms, perhaps not surprisingly. So one key thing to keep in mind about transform faults is that they commonly juxtapose lithosphere of different ages. And it turns out that this allows them to be extremely localized and narrow in dimension. And this is why they're so uh, sharp on the seafloor. If, for example, we were to look at a cross section through um, the white line here, A to A prime, we'd expect the lithosphere to be only a million or so years old on the south side of the transform fault based on how close it is to the ridge axis. North of the transform fault, however, the lithosphere is much farther from the trench axis, and you can see from the bathymetry uh, that it's deeper. And so it's likely several tens of millions um, of years older than on the south. And so a cross section through A to A prime would therefore look something like this with thin young lithosphere on the south and thicker older lithosphere on the north and a narrow uh, discrete uh, fault zone or transform boundary in between. It's common for these transforms to be somewhat serpentinized as mantle material from the younger lithosphere can accommodate and interact uh, with seawater. An interesting thing about this type of scenario is that it's actually been argued to lead to subduction initiation uh, because you have denser, colder lithosphere on one side of a discrete planar discontinuity, sometimes weak discrete planar discontinuity if it's occupied by serpentinite, serpentinite. And on the other side, you have warmer, less dense lithosphere um, that could potentially become the hanging wall of uh, a subduction interface. So transform faults like these are commonly implicated in subduction initiation type of uh, scenarios or tectonic models. It's worth noting too, though, that uh, younger transform faults are fairly symmetrical in terms of the age distribution across them. And these uh, in turn turn out to be noticeably wider and more distributed strikes of faults than uh, the previous type that juxtapose uh, or has more age uh, contrast across it. And so in cross section, these might have a whole range of uh, uh, sub parallel strikes of faults that uh, are not as discrete. Let's look now at some continental transform faults. The best example of a ridge-ridge transform on land is, of course, the San Andreas Fault that occupies California. This connects the Gulf of California rift zone to the Gordo Ridge. It's been active since about 30 million years ago. It's about 1,200 kilometers long with 470 kilometers of offset across the, the system and a slip rate of around 20 to 35 millimeters per year. We'll look more closely at the San Andreas Fault when we discuss strikes of geomorphology in the, in the next lecture segment. Another example of a transform developed on land is the ridge trench transform uh, in the Dead Sea. This connects the Red Sea spreading ridge with the Alpine conversion belt. It's been active since the mid Miocene and it's about a thousand kilometers long with 105 kilometers or so of offset but a much slower slip rate um, than the San Andreas, for example, of only two to six millimeters per year. The Alpine Fault is then a nice example of a trench-trench transform. Uh, it connects the Tonga-Kermadec Trench with the Macquarie Trench. Uh, 
It's been active since the mid-Miocene. It's not as long as the San Andreas or Dead Sea transforms, uh, but it has quite a fast slip rate comparable to, or perhaps larger than the San Andreas of 30 millimeters per year. So let's look now at strikes of faults that don't define plate boundaries and therefore are not considered transform faults. It's very common for strikes of faults to develop in regions of oblique convergence as a means of more efficiently partitioning strain between the strike parallel and strike uh, perpendicular components. The amount of partitioning that will occur depends on the degree of obliquity of convergence. It also depends on the degree of anisotropy in the fork, including the degree to which it inherits older uh, structures uh, that impart some anisotropy. And then it depends on the rheology of the orogenic wedge and the rheology of the wedge relative to uh, the backstop region. One well-known example among many is the median tectonic line that runs through southern Japan. This 1,000 kilometer long, uh, somewhat transcrustional strike slip fault is associated with subduction along the Nankai trough, where the direction is oblique. Um, to the overall plate boundary. Slip rate 5 to 10 millimeters per year or so. Similarly, the Great Sumatran Fault accommodates oblique uh, or even more oblique convergence between the Indo-Australian plate and the Sunda plate. This is a massive structure 1900 kilometers long and it's moving fairly quickly up to 27 uh, millimeters per year. The Philippine fault system is another example that accommodates oblique convergence of the Philippine sea plate within uh, the Philippine archipelago. Also a massive and fairly hazardous structure with several um, historical earthquakes of magnitude six or larger and um, fairly fast moving 20 millimeters per year. Note that those are some of the thousand kilometer long uh, major strike slip faults that define these strain partitioning zones, but just to note that these commonly occur on the 100 kilometer uh, scale within accretionary prisms as well. In the Nankai prism, for example, the strike slip fault defines the boundary between the outer and inner accretionary wedge. Uh, seismic imaging suggests that that just soles downward into uh, the megathrust shear zone beneath the wedge. So it's just part of the interplay um, between thrust faults there and uh, oblique slip. Similarly, the Cascadia accretionary wedge has a zone of strike slip partitioning that's localized along the backstop of the wedge, and that backstop is defined by a previously accreted island arc terrain, so sort of utilizing this pre-existing suture zone um, uh, as a way to partition uh, oblique strain. So lastly, let's talk about strike slip zones that define regions of tectonic escape, um, or also called tectonic extrusion. So Sean already briefly talked about these rigid indenter experiments in one of his lectures on the India-Asia collision zone. So this was a suite of experiments conducted using a plastic-like material called plasticine. And it's embedded in this case, it's got kind of a lid over it and then a free surface um, to the right and they push the indenter intended to represent India into the plasticine uh, material and observe uh, the associated deformation. This is a very famous early paper from the 70s, it's cited almost 5000 times at this point. And it gained a lot of traction because this simple analog model was able to explain some of the basic faults and blocks that appear to define southern China and Indochina, including producing several conjugate strikes of faults that appear to curve or rotate around toward the free surface to the east and southeast. Here's uh, just another view of this. I should note, though, that those plasticine experiments have been very controversial, and it's because they were conducted with a cover on top of them such that only lateral deformation is permitted in the analog models. But the reality is simply that the vast majority of deformation in the India-Asia collision zone is accommodated by thickening, and the strike-slip component is relatively minor.
You can see this visible in uh, the modern day GPS velocities shown here. The length of the black areas signifies uh, the deformation rate. And you can see that by far the largest arrows are along the Himalayan mountain front where uplift is occurring, whereas the GPS vectors for the eastern section of the origin are nearly an order of magnitude smaller. So just to keep in mind that these big strikes of faults, even though they're huge and they are actually accommodating part of the uh, strain uh, associated with the India Asia collision, there are essentially secondary features um, to the overall uplift in the region. A similar type of extrusion process is also invoked uh, for the North Anatolian fault system in Turkey. Uh, Arabia is considered the indenter in this case, and the free surface is the Aegean Sea and the Hellenic subduction zone. And the extrusion is then interpreted to be accommodated by the east and north Anatolian uh, left and right lateral fault zones. Just one final example here, southern Alaska along the subducting Yakutat terrain and associated Aleutian Trench uh, also exhibit some very prominent sort of curve of planar strike slip faults, mainly defined by the Denali Fault in the north and the Border Ranges Fault in the south. And these faults are generally interpreted to have formed in response to firstly the obliquity of the Pacific Plate, so due to strike slip partitioning, but the Yakutat block or terrain, that red area on the image on the left, is a subducting microcontinent and the curvature of both the Denali and Border Ranges Fault seems to correlate with the location of subduction of the Yakutat microplate at depth. So this should suggest that this may be causing some extrusion or escape of western Alaska around the Yakutat block and toward the Aleutian Trench as uh, the free surface here. So to summarize, that's just an overview of the three main tectonic settings for strike slip faults, including transform faults, which are only those that define plate boundaries, including zones of strike slip partitioning uh, that are those that accommodate oblique subduction, and then zones of extrusion or tectonic escape. And all three of these types are exposed on land, although the vast majority of transforms are uh, found in the oceans. Thanks for your attention.